Hey guys, thanks for joining me again for another episode in the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I am here today with Alyssa, who has um, many years of experience in assisted living, and we thought it would be helpful today to kind of have a dialogue between the two of us. Her coming from her experience with assisted living and seeing people when they're coming in uh, with loved ones that have dealt with cognitive impairment and dementia, kind of what to do from that standpoint, and then on my side, more of the, the clinical aspect. So we think that uh, a dialogue between us, kind of pulling on our mutual expertise, if you will, um, might be a good resource, and our, our hope is to provide some good education for everybody. Um, totally uh, agree. Actually, I want to go a little bit further back. So Philip Tipton, and uh, I'm sorry, I call him Philip. <laughs> um, we met. I don't know if it was by fate or whatever about a year ago because at Mayo Clinic where he is his fourth year uh, residency in neurology um, is only a mile from the assisted living from where of where I work and so we met through some mutual peer colleagues and then we began having conversations and realized that we really had a very synchronized vision and mission for um, in his case research um, medical research hopefully cures mine is more on the caregiving side so it's a different side of it but the two of us have the same mission to raise awareness and to help as many people as we can uh, find out how to cope with this devastating disease of dementia whether with depending on doesn't matter what type of dementia so Philip's skill set is obviously far different than mine, so um, actually I'm going to ask him a few questions today that actually I get asked every day when family members come into my office um, perplexed, confused, scared about what to do with their loved one. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and get started Ask, go ahead and ask a question or two. Um, one thing that, again, I, I hear this every day is... Um, I ask families when they come to me, uh, has your loved one actually been diagnosed with dementia? Mm -hmm. And I get a variety of answers. Some people say no, but it's very obvious they do have some cognitive impairment. I um, mean, the family knows it, but they don't know even how to get a diagnosis or why is that important. So I want to start with asking Dr. Tipton about getting a diagnosis. Who do you see? How, do you, how does that work and why is it important? That's, that's a great question. Um, so getting a diagnosis of dementia is very important for a few reasons. Um, you want to know if it's really dementia because as I mentioned in some of the previous episodes, there are lots of things that can mimic dementia and many of them are treatable. So if you're faced with a potential diagnosis of something that you know we may not have a cure for mm -hmm. versus being able to find out that maybe somebody's thyroid is abnormal or um, uh, maybe they have a vitamin deficiency or maybe they're depressed. Um, a lot of people uh, with depression actually come in with cognitive complaints and we actually call that pseudo dementia sometimes. Um, so it's really important to find these things because we can treat them and that's obviously a big game changer and it all comes down to expectations. Um, if someone has dementia, um, regardless of the type, and we'll get into those a little later, but if someone has dementia, um, our expectations are much different than if someone has thyroid disease and we can treat that. So it's really about laying expectations and, and you know, the word that we would use as, as physicians is what's the prognosis, what do things look like. Um, so it's all about helping people to understand what do I expect. So whether it's for the patient or whether it's for loved ones of the patient too. So let me give you a, a situation. Mm -hmm. Again, this is every day I deal with this in my office because I'm the admissions director. And so people, the first place they come is in my office. And by the time they get in my office, I'm usually dealing with a family that's sometimes borderline desperate. Um, they wouldn't have come to an assisted living community unless things had gotten pretty bad. So our uh, first thing I say is, uh, start. would you mind describing to me what it's like at home, your loved one? Uh, what is it the day in the life uh, of your loved one? And so 
they'll begin describing these things. And for me, it's clearly that there's some cognitive impairment. I don't know what the cause of it is, but usually they'll say to me, this has been going on for a few years or um, at least six months, and it seems to be getting worse, which is why they come to see me. So I'll ask, um, have you been to see a neurologist or what type of doctor? And a lot of times I get sort of a deer in headlights response. And I'm dealing with uh, very highly educated people. Um, in some cases, medical people, <laughs> nurses, doctors, but that's not their field of expertise. Um, so basically, I'm going to say to Dr. Tipton that if you were in my shoes, what would you recommend to that family about getting a diagnosis, how to do it, etc.? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great question too because again, it kind of goes back to expectations. So if you don't have the right diagnosis, then your expectations, if they're right, it's purely luck um, and more, more times than not, it would be wrong. So in getting a diagnosis of dementia, uh, it really starts when you, you as a loved one, a spouse of someone, start to see a change. Um, so if you notice that um, uh, your loved one, their behavior is changing. Maybe their day-to-day um, uh, -day, uh, activities are becoming dominated by one thing. Say, um, you know, the individual used to do the crossword puzzle every now and then, and now they just do the crossword puzzle all day. Um, or maybe their memory slipping. And we're not just talking about, oh, I can't remember where I parked my car, but, you know, I left the stove on, or we're forgetting to pay bills. Um, that kind of thing. Things that are starting to show up as, as major red flags. That's probably the time to go in to see your primary care physician. And most of the time, um, the, the goal at that point is to look for those reversible causes of cognitive impairment. And, you know, that interaction can look very different. I'm, I'm not a primary care physician, but um, oftentimes what ends up happening is once those other things have been ruled out, you know, maybe it's a metabolic disorder, and by metabolic I mean maybe there's some issues with electrolytes or uh, blood sugar or something like that. Once those kinds of things are kind of checked off and ruled out, then it's probably time to get a specialist involved. And in the case of, you know, concern about cognitive impairment, the right specialist would be a neurologist. Um, we actually have neurologists that are um, super specialized, if you will, that deal with them. Um, neurologists that go through a behavioral or cognitive fellowship like the one that I'm going to be doing next year. Um, and so that interaction um, actually starts a lot like your interaction with your patients. We want to know, you know, what's a day in the life like? Mm -hmm. And we start to hear about the flavor. Um, I like to use the word flavor because many of these different types of dementia or causes of dementia rather have a different flavor. Um, and and so once we start to pick up on that flavor, then we know how to prune or test moving on from there. So that first interaction with the neurologist is going to be a long conversation where we get a good history. A history not only from the patient, but also a history from the loved ones. We need a, another eyewitness, so to speak. And then from that, we know how to tailor our questions. And then we'll do an exam, a thorough neurologic examination, an, an exam that really only a neurologist gets enough practice doing to be able to do it well. Um, so it's going to be tailored to that individual and what's heard in the history. And so from then that point, we still have sort of a broad differential diagnosis of what may be causing the dementia if we've said that things are to a degree that we're calling it dementia, it's diagnosed with dementia. And so using different tests to narrow it down to what cause of dementia we're dealing with. The type of dementia. The type of dementia. So to that point, you know, Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, but uh, uh, the second most common cause of dementia is Lewy body dementia, and those two look very different. Well, I tell you